on this uh, particular intern uh, practice that you have done? Yeah. Yeah. And we are just going to go through the data of that one, one after the other. Okay. Now. Can you all see this kind of? Can you see this data on the board? Okay, so this is from one of the experiment that was done on baby bouncer. Okay, as you can see here, the first column has got mass in grams. Okay, but this is when it was in the old form. I would suggest change that to kilograms. Okay. So the first column, rather than writing in grams, write in kilograms. And so what does that become? In kilograms when you write the mass. 16 divided by 1000. So what is that? 0 0.016. 0.001. So you really don't need to write the 0.01 with everyone, but just write at the top plus and minus 0.01 kg is the uncertainty and that's the mass in kilograms. So we will change all of these in here. Okay, and you don't need to write those 1, 2, 3, whatever. Instead, you will only have the first one, 0 0.01 and then the 0 0.032, 0 0.048, 0 0.060, 0 0.072, 0 0.088, 0 .08, etc. 0 0.104 and 0 0.120. That's what. How, that's how the data should be written in the first column. First column always is going to be your independent variable. And you know what an independent variable is. Independent variable is something that you change in the experiment. Okay. Next column, there are three columns for dependent variable. Okay. So this was the baby bouncer experiment, dependent variable was the time period, yes? yes? So that's what the dependent variable is, time period. And this is for 10 oscillation, you know why it was done for 10? Because for 1, it is really difficult to measure. One more thing you need to write on top is time for 10 oscillations. plus and minus 0.2 seconds. And you know what is this 0.2 seconds for? Reaction error. Human reaction time. Okay. It takes about 0.2 seconds uh, difference before you think you have to stop and you actually stop. Okay. So that's the reaction time error. Next there is a column for period which is Whatever the average of three readings is. Now to my class, I have been telling them to do this at least five times rather than three times. The reason I'm asking them to do this five times because we want a good spread. Okay, any systematic error, random error, we want to minimize them. That's why they are doing it for five times. So once you have those five readings, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and that's 5.56, 5.6, Let's assume this one is 5.62 and then the fifth one is 5.12. Okay, average. You all know how to work out the average, isn't it? But I'm still going to do it. Average for that one is 5.56 plus 5.6 plus 5.65 plus 5.62 plus 5.12 divided.
divided by 5, which is 5.1. So the initial average 5.51 for 10 oscillations, average for 10 oscillations, and then what you do is plus and minus uncertainty. Okay, now plus and minus uncertainty has got nothing to do with this value. This one you will keep as it is, no use in calculations at all. Just to let us know as well as you know that there is a reaction time error for which you are accounting for. Okay. But you are not using that anywhere in calculation. Does anybody know how do you work out this uncertainty with half range? Okay. And what is the range here? The biggest number is this 5.65 and the smallest number is 5.12. So what you do is 5.65 minus 5.12 gives me 0.53. That's your range. 0.53 is the range. Divide that by 2. Okay. So when I divide that by 2, my answer is 0.265. That's what my uncertainty is half range. So I use half range for uncertainty. 0 0.51, 5.51 plus and minus 0 0.265. Initially I can write it as it is. I'm not doing any um, averaging here. I'm not doing, sorry, any rounding here. Okay. Next you do is period which is one oscillation. So how do we get one oscillation from 10? Just simply divided by 10. That means this number also gets divided by 10. So plus and minus 0 0.02 seconds. Okay. And then you write the values there. So those are your rows. Then this one will stay. This divided by 10 is 0 0.5. 5, 1 plus and minus this also gets divided by 10 so it becomes 0 0.0265 now I'm not going to leave them like that instead I'm going to round them so when we round them the first thing is we are going to look at the uncertainty uncertainty is always written in one significant figure only okay so what will be the final rounding for uncertainty day? 0 0.03. So this one will become 0 0.03. How many places are there after decimal? Two. So that many decimal places I'm going to keep on this side. Okay. That means I need to get rid of that one because that one is not going to make any difference. So that's my final answer for period one oscillation. Do you get this? Yeah. yeah. This rounding is important. Can you see the significant figures of the reading are not matching with the significant figures of uncertainty? Okay. For uncertainty, you have to remember just one thing, one significant figure. Okay. And for the real value, same number of decimal places. So they, there are two significant figures, but one significant figure with the uncertainty. Same thing here. We had two significant figures for period because this is the another variable we are using. That's going to be our final dependent variable column. And this is our final independent variable column. How many significant figures? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So my significant figures of independent variable should tally with the dependent one. Okay, so I'm all right till here, but there is a problem here. So I'll get rid of that 4. I'll get rid of this 0 as well. Okay, does that make sense? Yep, yeah? okay. Next is same 
anyway, uh, we will practice one more, maybe the last one. 13.78, 13.84, let's imagine 13.91, 13.71, and 13.62. Average is easy to work out. Somebody help me with average and another person help me with uncertainty. Shape. 
saying to you. Miss, do you want to talk about anything? Okay, so this is going to be a graph like this. Okay, now this is a little bit I want to train you on. Whenever you will be given a piece of paper, you will be given a theoretical equation as well with it. Okay, that equation you may not have come across up till now in physics. You might say, oh wow, what is it? I've never seen it before. Okay. This equation you are certainly more familiar with after doing simple harmonic motion in mechanics. This makes sense to you guys? Yes? Okay. But certainly the one you are getting in your actual assessment, you have never seen that equation before. Okay. But you can definitely recognize two quantities that you are working on. Okay. What are the two variables we are mainly focusing on in this experiment? Time period and mass. So this equation, what kind of relationship time has with mass from that equation? Can you tell me? Not from the graph, but from the equation. What kind of relationship is this? It's like this. T is 2 pi square root m divided by square root so what kind of relationship is this? Yeah. So do you just say mass has square root relationship? With whom? With time. Time has square root relationship with K as well. But there's a difference. What does it mean when it is on top and the bottom? Time is directly proportional to square root m. Okay. Whereas with k, it is indirectly proportional to. If t is going up, m is going up, but in its square root. t is going up, k is going down in its square root. Or the other way. If k goes up, k will go down by its square value. m going up, t will go up, but by its square value. Okay, that's the relationship. They are directly related. Yes? Like this, and you will say, Oh, it looks like a straight line. But no, 
first graph is never going to be a straight line in the standard. Okay, it's going to give you some kind of a curve. Okay, and you cannot decide. I don't know, I can't remember whether it is a square root or whatever. In that case, focus on the equation. Does that make sense? Why I am showing you the equation? Because that's going to help you to decide what kind of shape I need to give to this graph. Yes? So, once you know that's the graph, I want to now plot a straight line graph. What should I do to this data to get a straight line graph? Or, let's visit those four graphs again and see how am I going to change this graph to a straight line. I will plot y against square root x. And that should be a straight line. Ideally like this, under the real proper situation, experimental condition. But because when we do experiments, there are a lot of inaccuracies, errors involved. There is a possibility the graph might become like this. Do not panic. Do not force your graph through origin. Imagine your points are kind of like that. And what you do is I'll just pick one of the point and I'll make it like this. No. Try to draw a line that is closer to most of the points. You're drawing the line of base fit. Line of the base fit is the line closer to most of the points. And I'll come back to this when students force the line to go through here, okay, what problem they have to face when they do the green pen? Because green pen is 20 minutes. And 20 minutes, this is the very first step gone wrong. A lot of things after that, this is quite a big standard, okay. A lot of things you will be writing in this. A lot of calculations you will be doing in this. So we can't afford to make a mistake right at the beginning. Okay, so... In that case, draw the line of base fit here. This graph, easy now, you've got the method. x squared should give me a straight line. This one, I should plot y against 1 over x, and that should give me a straight line. I should plot y against 1 over x squared, and that should give me a straight line. This is y in x, y in x, y in x, y in x. So these are the only four graphs you have to kind of keep in your head. Nothing more than that. Yes? Now, once you have figured out that yes, it's a square root relationship. So what do you do in the table next? You work out the... And please remember, like there are one or two students even in my class, they think... First graph is not important. I can figure out from the equation what is the relationship. So I'll just straight away go to the second graph. No worries. You're not getting your decision from the equation. Yes, it's a helpful thing. But you're showing the marker that you are making a decision from your first graph what I need to do to one of the variables to get a straight line graph. Okay. So... Your second graph, you want to be a straight line. First form, M and T, like this. So what should we do to get a straight line? T against? Square root M. Okay. So what you need to do is have another column here. Work out square M values. Okay. But before you do that, the things that you need to write in the table, unit. What will be the unit for mass when you do the square root? Unit will also become square root kg. Or square root kg can be written as kg raised to half. Okay, either of those should be written with the thing there. Okay, so that is complete. Any of these things in the labels are missing. Okay, you have brilliant results. But you have missed on proper titles, 
proper units, reaction time error and things like that, your table will not be marked more than achieved. Depending upon how much other things you have covered. Okay, you put all these things properly and your data is within the range, expected range, then you get married for the table. Okay, and you need to get all the merits to get overall merit. Okay, merit is the hardest in this standard. Well, if you can manage merit, jump from merit to excellence is not that difficult. But between A and M, there's a big, big gap. Okay, next. So, you change all of these to square root form. So, remember what is there? Plus and minus 0 0.001. And you work out the square root of this. Which is 0 0.016 plus and minus 0 0.001. So you know how to handle the uncertainty here. It's a square root thing. Yesterday I did go over this, but I will briefly go over it again. So what do I need to do here? Change it to percentage. So I will have 0 0.016. Plus and minus 0 0.01. I'll show you how I did it. 0 0.0001 divided by 0 0.016 times 100. And how much that comes? 0 0.001 divided by 0.025%. 6.25%. So I'll write that value here, 6.25%. And you know what I will advise? Have the table fully like this. When you're making a table, make sure keep the last column empty for transform to data. The title is not transform data, but the actual whatever you're changing. You're changing M. So you will write square root M there. But at the bottom of the table, show these calculations because you're doing these calculations for all of them and at least the whosoever is marking your paper will be checking these calculations okay whether you have done the correct uncertainty calculation or not okay and believe it it takes teachers each student's paper about 45 minutes to mark Initially, when we start marking, it takes one hour on one paper to mark. This is hardest for us also to mark. Uh, so now what we do is square root of 0 0.0061. 1, 6. Which is 0 0.126. I'll leave that here that present. And half of 6.25 because the power is raised to half. That's what the square root means. So that's why I'm doing dividing it by uh, 6.25 divided by 2. So I get 3.125 0, 0126 plus and minus 3.125 percent it is still. Now I'm going to change it back to original form. So what do I do? Times that by 0.126 divided by 100 and what do I get? 0 0.126 plus and minus 0 0.0039 I think. Okay. Likewise you will do for all of them and write those values here. Now I'm going to round them. So point plus and minus point zero zero four because I don't want more than one significant figure. I'm rounding this one. Okay, so what will happen to this one? One, two, three. So I can keep all of them. Okay. One, two, six. And same way you will work out the square root m value for all of them. Yes?
Easy? Any questions so far? No. Next, what we are going to do is once you have got all these things done, make a graph of square root m hg raised to half against time period or period capital T in seconds and plot the points. Suppose your first point is here, second point is there. What I'll do is I'll draw the line and then I'll put the points off just to make it quick. Okay. So this is simple with this number and that number. I have plotted the points. I'm not going to consider these one anything yet. These one for anything or this number for anything. Okay. Just the front bit and I have done the plots. Now I'm going to focus on these numbers. Okay. So if I had, suppose here was my point 1, point 2, point 3 and so on. And then I have a number point zero zero three. So that means what I need to do is from here I go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. That's point zero three up and down. Okay, and for the next number, suppose my value was 0 0.01. So what I'll do is I'll just go one up, one down, draw the bar. These are called as error bars. Okay, they, you are drawing the error bars from uncertainty. Same way, suppose the next one was plus and minus 0 0.04. So what I'll do is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. But you're counting these numbers on your grids. Okay, how you are dividing the grid. That's very important. Same way you draw the bar here, whatever the number is, you draw the bar there. Okay, these are your vertical error bars. Now, ideally, they should be quite distinct. You shouldn't have much problem in getting good spread of, like they're not too close to the actual point. Okay, looks like the actual experiment that you're doing, you're not going to have problem with that one as well. Okay, then what you do with this bars is join this end of the, the bottom end of this bar with the top end of that bar. Okay. You are not going to focus on any other points, just those two points and draw a line. And ideally draw that as broken line. Okay, and extend that line to Y as well as broken line. Okay, so you have the blue line which is your base fit line and you have your red line which is called as error line. Okay, that's one way of drawing error line. Other way of drawing error line is In 
instead of going from the bottom to the top, you can also come from top to bottom. So from this point to this point and join them. Again with the broken line, dotted line. Another way of drawing error line. The reason I have to show you both because sometimes one thing you need to remember when you draw the line and that's how it shows the error line is a correct line. Either of those, if you can see this one, starts from here, crosses the line and ends up on the other side. This one starts from the other side but crosses and comes on the opposite side. Okay, <coughs> now here the red is more steeper than blue and here the blue is more steeper than red. Okay, sometimes when students draw the error line, if this is the original, the error line also kind of go like this. That means the, that particular part they have to ignore, they might have to look for the other side and that might give them a good error line. Not happens often but sometimes it does happen that's why I have to make you familiar with either of those. Okay now this line because it's steeper this one is going to have a bigger gradient than the blue one. It's called as maximum error line. Okay and this one is called as minimum error line. Get it? Okay. Now you are going to pick two points on the blue one. Maybe this point is distinctly on the line and we know this point is on the line. Draw the triangle to work out the gradient. Work out the gradient of blue line and let's write the gradient of basic fifth line is M, which is, let's assume that value is 2.65. Okay. Then you work out the gradient of error line, which is M dash. It's not M1, it's M dash. Okay. Uh, as you can see, the rate is steeper, so obviously this value is going to be bigger than the other one. And let's assume that value is 2.83. Okay. Then what you do? Why do we have the error line. We have error line because this is our approximation. This is how we approximate that this is my base fit line. But in reality, your base fit line is, if suppose I had joined the other side as well, I'll just try to show you both the lines on one. But you don't need to draw two. You only need to draw one of the error line. This one. In reality, your baseline is somewhere in between these two. Okay, it could be I any place. So that much uncertain you are in drawing your base fit line. You're not sure where exactly it is in this part. Okay, so that's why, why we have to have the error line. So now the gradient of this error line is M dash which is bigger. So uncertainty in the gradient. Uncertainty. It is 
plus and minus 0 0.18. This is gradient with uncertainty. Does that make sense? How do I take this 0 0.18 with it? So the error line gradient minus the base fit line gradient is that much you are uncertain about the gradient value. So the gradient is somewhere between this range. 2.65 plus and minus 0.18. Yeah. Next is you're going to round this. Remember again uncertainty will go in one significant figure so it becomes 0 0.2. So one thing after the decimal what will happen on this side? 2.7. That's your gradient plus and minus uncertainty. Okay. Then you write the equation, mathematical equation of this line, which is like how we write y equals mx plus c. What is y here? Y is t is m is the gradient. So that's 2.7 plus and minus 0 0.2. The reason I have the bracket because my x value should be multiplied to both of them. If I don't have the bracket, that means it's only multiplied here. Get it? And then I write the C intercept plus C. How much is that? 0.1 plus and minus. And you see it's actually going down as well. This one also I have to account for. So you won't have whatever the value is, but what is the difference? Maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So kind of 0 0.045, which when I round it to, it becomes 0. 0. I won't make it 1. 0 0.05. So I'll have to write another 0 here. 0 0.05. So C intercept will also have uncertainty because of error line. Okay? Make sense? Why we have to work out the gradient and everything. Now how many of you uh, with what stage you are with your experiment? Have you done the experiment? That baby bouncer, this experiment. Have you got the data with you? No. Have you no? no? I don't have it right now. Uh, like uh, oh, not yeah. now, yeah. but like uh, what I mean is to yeah. play with the data at home. You all have the experimental results with you. Yeah. Yes. So have you done the first graph? Yeah. Yeah. Was it a curve? Yeah. Have you done the second graph? Yeah. So have you done the error line with it? No. No. So will you now be able to do the error line, gradient calculation, and mathematical equation part? I think we should stop here. Yeah? Or you are okay to continue further? Uh, let's go. Keep going. Keep going? Yeah. Okay. In that case, next part what you have to do is, if I remember, in the marking grid, this is the second last requirement for merit, writing the mathematical equation. But if suppose you say, oh, what if I just want to achieve, what do I need to write for achieve for the equation? <coughs> In that case, you just write, you've done the graphs and things like that, but then you're writing T is directly proportional to square root of M. If I am increasing M, T will also increase in its square value. That will give you a conclusion pick for achievement. Okay. Next, what you need to do, that's the last but quite challenging requirement of merit, is you're comparing, this is your practical equation. This you've got from your experiment. You're comparing this equation with the theoretical equation. Theoretical equation is t equals 2 pi square root m divided by k. Okay. And somewhere in the paper, 
the k value will be given. And let's assume k value is 8 times 10 to the power of negative 2 plus and minus 0.4 times mm -hmm. 10 to the power of negative 2. That's the k value. Okay, so what you're going to do is Either you are going to substitute this k value into this equation and get the gradient. No worries. Compare that gradient with the experimental gradient. That's one way. <coughs> or you use this gradient value and calculate the value of k. Okay. And try to show that value closer to this. Now mine is an arbitrary number. Okay, you have the actual experiment now because I was just taking the numbers on my own as I was explaining it. Has anybody done this equation? No, no, nobody is at this stage? No, that's okay. I'll show you the calculation. T is 2.7 plus and minus 0 0.2 square root M plus 0 0.10 plus and minus 0 0.05 is my equation. And my mathematical equation is my, sorry, given theoretical equation is 2 pi square root M over square root K. Okay, I do not have any intercept here. Okay, why you are getting an intercept is mainly because of errors in your experiment. Random error or systematic error. And you know your black book. You're not just writing that random error and systematic error are the cause of, but you're explaining exactly which one. And those are being explained in your book on page. systematic error in terms of your experiment. Okay, so you're explaining about that intercept because of these errors, random error like reaction time error. Could be parallax error, okay, when you're doing some kind of measurement. So all those you are going to explain for this end. Okay, so we are going to ignore this part of the equation. We are only going to focus the first part of the equation which looks more familiar. Okay, T is same as T. So that means 2.7 plus and minus 0 0.2 square root M is equal to 2 pi square root M over square root K. Because T is same as T. So I can actually make this value equal to this value. Do you get this? Yeah. Yep. So now if you look at square root m and square root m is common. Gone. What am I left with? A number plus and minus this and a constant and a square root k. Yes. So what I do, I make k as my subject. So if I make k as my subject, what do I get? 2 pi divided by 2.7 plus and minus 0.2. Yes. And now I calculate k is 2 pi divided by 
divided by 2.7 plus and minus 0.2. Because when I do this, when I want to get rid of square root value, uh, sign, what have I done? I've done the square of this. That means I need to do the square of this side as well. Now it's all numbers. And I can do simple calculation to get the k value. Yes, but remember 0 0.2 in the calculation. And how do we handle that? Same percentage uncertainty calculation. Get it? And then this k should ideally be similar to that number given in the paper. That k value is 8 times this. If it's not closer to that number, then you explain. If it is, Even if it is closer to that number, you still explain the places that you have been accurate. So you will emphasize on accuracy improving techniques and in which way you have been accurate. Does that make sense? So this is one way to compare the experimental value with theoretical value or you could also do is you know now here 2 pi square root k is equal to that so 2 pi substitute the value of k that is given 8 times 10 to the power of negative 2 plus and minus 0 0.4 times negative 2 should be equal to 2.7 plus and minus 0 0.2 so either you do this calculation and show that value closer to this. You don't have to do both. One. But remember, uncertainty needs to be handled with percentage calculations. Yes? The remaining part of the report, I think I'll better tell you in the next week. I have covered almost 70% of it now. Okay, but what I wanted to show you was... Does anybody wants to take down something? Because I'm going to rub at least one of the board to show you something on the web that will be helpful to you. Can I clean this? You must be familiar with Are you familiar with this page? Yes. Okay. Now if you look at on the top very end, level 3. You're all level 3. Click on this one. And this will give you our achievement standard numbers and their commentary. So this one is 91521. And I'm going to open up this and see what is the requirement of this. Now the first point is all ministry language, doesn't applicable to us, but this is the one that is relevant. All those points when they are covered in your actual assessment, you are eligible to get achieved. Okay, so achieved us just need these things to be covered for the standard. If we go further, the next bullet, carry out in-depth practical investigation. This involves merit. Okay. And then you go further down, carry out a comprehensive practical investigation. That's what is needed for excellence. Okay. I would recommend read through this once you become familiar with the entire standard. You are 70% familiar with it. So only 30% needs to be covered. Okay. Now this is not your only practice. I am going to make sure even through Mr. Khal, you will practice another two exemplars. You may not do experiment, but you will be given data to practice. Okay. Next, if we go back on this and still further back, can you see on this page, this side, clarifications written? Okay, and it says all levels. Open up that. This is also good information for us to understand 
what is needed in this standard. Can I use a context that uh, this is mainly for the teachers, but it is helpful for the students as well to read through these clarifications. Okay. So I would say go through most of this page. Okay. Next, you go back. If you want to help yourself further, TKR resources and conditions of assessment, level 3, click on that, go down, you might have seen this in other subjects, 3.1, that's one we are looking on, okay, and you are so lucky, the actual example that's on NZQA is a baby bounce, okay, so see what they have done. They have given the marking criteria there. Okay. You did the baby bouncer with hexop. That's the only difference, but this is with the spring. So a little bit your discussion is going to vary. Even if you try to cheat, that's okay. Same thing. And this is the important bit for you to look at. What achieve needs, what merit needs, and what excellence needs. Okay. Yeah. If you can't follow something there, come and ask us. Next, was there anything? Yeah, there was one more thing I wanted to show you guys there. That is, if you go on to... Hello. This place I was talking about. There's absolutely no room to sit and work. I was just wondering, even if this part would go.